Good afternoon and welcome to Genomics Gupshap. Genomics Gupshap is an initiative by Map My Genome to create a community around genomics and to simplify genomics for everyone. I'm Anu Acharya, your host for this exciting Gupshap. And we are creating this community by bringing together experts from allied areas like medicine, genetic counseling, nutrition, fitness, and much more. So please join us as we spread this word about this exciting science of genomics. We are now available on your favorite podcast as well. Just search for Genomics Cup Shop on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or Google Podcast. Today is a very, very special episode. This is the 50th episode. We didn't think we would get 250 episodes, but we do. And not only that, we have somebody really special who not only understands what's going on with genetics, but he can actually combine a lot of different parts of uh, the pieces of the puzzle, as you will. Uh, we have Dr. Evian Gordon, who is uh, an integrative neuroscientist. He's the founder of Total Brain, which is now part of Sondermine. He set up the world's first international database of more than a million records. He has authored at least five books that I'm aware of and has been cited by more than 32,000 papers and has an H index of one, not three. So he integrates a lot of different pieces, like I mentioned, clinical, psychological, and biological models. And not only all of that, not only all his academic accomplishments, he's also an amazing painter. He has his own podcast, and there's a lot more which we can discover. So welcome to Genomics Gapshap, uh, Dr. Avian God. Well, thank you so much, Ani. You know, I just have to say at the beginning that working with you and Map My Genome has been one of the real joys of the past 40 years. It's a very challenging thing to work across the landscape of the human brain and mind. And you personally exemplify what integration is really meant to be about. And not just your super smartness, but and innovation and your, your serial entrepreneurship, but just the loyalty and the way that you stick to the mission and you can be you're trusted to always be solution focused. And it's just been a, a genuine, amazing pleasure and joy to work with you and with Matt Margina. Thank you so much. I think uh, we've enjoyed it. I think we've known each other for more than 10 years now, I think. I, yeah. I do remember uh, we had many, many discussions and, and so on. But first, let I, I think our viewers will probably want to know more about you first. You know, you are, uh, you know, you you are a neuroscientist. Uh, it's a lot of different things going on in our brains. Uh, but maybe you can tell us what inspired you to this fascinating science of neuro neuroscience. Yeah, look, I'll try and give distilled answers, but it's a milestone uh, podcast, and you've asked me to be sort of broad in my scope, and we'll go to some details. And look, I, I was privileged to be born. I'm a son of Africa. I was born in South Africa before I immigrated to the United States, Sydney first, and then the United States. And my education was at the University of Atwater's in Johannesburg. And um, I, I, I was just privileged to go through, uh, you know, all the science degrees, and uh, yeah, BSc in honors and a master's and then converted that into a PhD in serum lipids in the heart, which was marvelous. It was at a time when serum lipids were being discovered. Mm -hmm. um, and and my PhD supervisor, who set up, it turns out, set up the, the cradle of humankind um, for reasons I'll tell you in a moment in Southern Africa. He was responsible for overseeing the fossils that were being discovered in Southern Africa. And the most important fossil was the woman who changed my life, Mrs. Plays, that Scientific American has said is the most one of the 25 most important discoveries in history. Now, why? Mm -hmm. Because it's the missing link from between humans and 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 quadrupeds okay. and and apes. And the thing that was shocking about it to many people um, at the time, many disbelievers, is that. Um, the human brain, you know, Mrs. Players was bipedal, and you can see here from the the, the 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 spine at the back of the skull that only happens with some with with a species that is walking on two legs, and so here we had essentially a bipedal ape, which meant this was clearly one of our early ancestors about three million years ago that trebled in size in mm -hmm. the last three million years from Australopithecus, which is Mrs. Players, Plesianthropus, 
to Homo habilis, to Homo erectus, to us. Now, how did that lead me to neuroscience? Well, there I was doing my PhD in serum lipids and on the golden highways to become a cardiologist with all this marvelous privileged existence through the sort of science and physics and psychology. And it was just, I was destined to be on the golden highways to cardiology. And when I saw Mrs. Place and my PhD supervisor, Philip Valentine Tobias, put this fossil in my hands and I turned it over. And there was that for Raymond Magnum, that bipedal, unambiguous, silent, wow. nobody is incontrovertible. Literally, I knew. I said to him, so you're telling me that the brain has trebled in size and all the implications that that has to humankind. And I'm going to do my PhD in serum lipids. And he said, that's, that's correct. I said, well, let me tell you, when I'm finished my PhD, which I did, I'm going to switch to the brain. And that's literally how I became a brain scientist. And in those days, I knew it was the dirt roads of brain science. Everybody I knew thought that this was the strangest thing to do, to leave the golden highways of cardiology, of a cardiologist. I was not a cardiologist. I was on the path to being a cardiologist, to the dirt roads of brain science. And that is this. And I haven't stopped for a day. It's been a absolute privilege even though it's been very very challenging but i never doubted my or chat or you know thought that it was the wrong thing but every day feels like a privilege to be a brain warrior dirt road brain warrior and that's essentially how my career happened and stays that way every day wow that's that's absolutely fascinating i think uh when when you think about the the heart and and the mind um you know, I think you found a lot of connections though, right? I mean, you you were studying uh, cardiology and then you went to the brain, but there must be a connection, right? I mean, there is something that is connecting the two. And I think the fact that you've done both maybe gives, puts you in a unique place to to sort of understand how everything is connected. Well, that, that is absolutely true. And so to me to look at, and as my career unfolded, I, it was more than just about the brain, because normally, and maybe we'll touch on it, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to get a job. I was, I was left South Africa and was on my way to apply for a job at Harvard, actually, and stopped in in Sydney and got offered a job to uh, found the, uh, a brain institute in the largest hospital in the Southern Hemisphere. And, and that was remarkable because the the, fa the CEO of the hospital, um, Bernie Amos, he just was one of those unique people who just said, do whatever you want, I'll back you. And I said, no, you won't. Like, what I want is I want to put an institute together with everybody from different disciplines, all interconnecting. And he did. He allowed us to bring in physicists, mathematicians, connect to psychology, neurology, radiology. And... Um, that was uh, what that allowed me to see deeply in terms of what you're saying, because most of science is very siloed, of course. And so that's what I've loved about Map My Genome and about you in particular, the breadth of thinking about genetics and its interconnection in the brain body system. And so that was really, I was a system level person for whatever reason. And so the brain body connection was great. And I'll just say one other thing I knew. At the end of that journey, a few years ago, um, I connected to, by luck, or connected to the American Heart Association and have been co developing an online brain heart pillars of health uh, uh, kind of product, really, that you're involved with, my genome, I'm involved with. And that's kind of closed the circle and, and, and marvelously so because it brings together not just the brain and the heart and their amazing interconnection, but also the genetics with respect to all the pillars of health. So I feel surprisingly kind of integrated in their journey in ways that I would never have predicted. So, so this brain database that you mentioned in Sydney, when was that? Uh, that was in before 2000? 1983. I immigrated to Sydney in 1982 and I was offered the job, like, on the, for some reason, they were misguided enough to offer me that job right away. We were, like, 80 applicants. And I, for some reason, I think they were looking for someone who was a little more integrative. And anyway, the long and the short of it, I was lucky enough to get that job and, and got this incredible backing by this marvelous hospital, Westmead Hospital. It's one of the greatest hospitals in the world. And, um, and then 
Yeah, then basically that was 1983. I decided once the, they backed me to set up this database and a standardized database. See, I'd come from the heart, which was the Framingham study. I mean, the Framingham study it was the study that changed medicine. I mean, they did the whole city of Framingham. They standardized everything. And I went, why do we not do that in the brain? And I was like, naive and, and had enough hubris and, and stupidity to go, yeah, let's do it in the brain. And for some reason, uh, Bernie of Amos and and, and the, the man who hired me, that was from, he was the head of the Department of Psychiatry, uh, Mears, Professor Mears, um, Russell Mears, very, very uh, brilliant psychotherapist, but he didn't, he wanted somebody to run the brain piece. And so he, they just empowered me to do it. And I, I said, I'm going to set up the world's first standardized integrative database. And and um, databases were not fashionable in those days. It was like way too challenging to the silo world to think that you could do that in a serious manner. But because I had this unique opportunity of bringing all these people together or the diff to, to some degree connections to all these people. But then I also got lucky, I knew I, I, um, I met with, you know, one of many great collaborators, but probably the one who influenced me the most with databases was the head of the Human Brain Project in Washington, Stephen Kozlow. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, but he was, he was, I would say, other than the physicist I worked with at Westmead, Chris Rennie, who was just brilliant and marvelous. Um, he really um, helped me understand that databases, he had been given $100 million from NIH to set up databases across the United States after the Genome Project. So yeah, you had the Genome Project, he was given this, and he helped me see that databases is complicated. And that, so I asked him, how many of the databases you've set up for this $100 million? And many of them became Nobel Prize laureates and all sorts of things. He said, how many collaborate? And he said, none. I went, are you serious? How is that possible? He said, you know, welcome to America, dude. Like everybody wants to be the boss and they're not that, you know, when it comes to it, it's hard to bring people together on scale. So I said, and how much of this is standardized? He said, none of it. So I said, okay, I am, that is what I'm doing. And I just deepened that determination to be the first standardized system to bring everything together, whatever it is, genetics, cognition, electrical brain function, neuropsychology, brain imaging, MRI, DTI, fMRI, and dozens of tests, demographic tests, 10 different clinical disorders. So yeah, I know it sounds fanciful that, you know, they're going to be 82,000, you know, uh, um, citations or whatever, and 300 publications, a million data sets, 8 billion data points from all of the way that I, I just set up this very systematic spectrum of tests within each domain, like mm -hmm. neuropsychology, psychophysiology, EEGs, fMRI, so that there was a mountain of information. But if anybody in the world wanted to collaborate with us, they only could collaborate if they were using the standardized elements, the like Lego pieces that I'd set up. And the point about that, I knew is that it means that any Lego piece you have, because the brain and the whole brain body system is so integrated, any Lego piece, as long as it's one of those Lego pieces, you could then infer mm -hmm. connections, implications, you could elucidate various sort of pathways. And ultimately, as you and I have discussed, you know, when we, when we finally close the loop and do our brain body genetics database, you can start and then connect to every other brain body genetics database in the planet, you then can start really shedding light on the interconnected mechanisms, which of course the holy grail of everything. So that was my goal. I mean, I didn't realize that some of it would actually you know, be plausible, but it became super plausible. Um, I have to say though, at the beginning, nobody believed it could be done. Nobody. Execute. Uh, no, I, people said to me, There's, you'll be back in cardiology pretty soon, dude, because this is just not going to, you know, I'll tell you, I'll just tell you in the interest of time, I knew, the one thing I remember people saying to me is they said to me, you can't get two scientists to agree on anything. How do you think you're going to get hundreds of scientists to agree on everything? And I said, well, I don't expect that, but I do believe that they are first movers. And, you know, like if you look at the adoption curve, they're like, 6% of people are first movers. I said, 
I'm going to find those first movers. I'm not looking even for the second movers, let alone the laggards who, you know, you can't change them till, you know, bury the dead and bayonet the wounded. Uh, for that paradigm shift, as Thomas Kuhn in 1972 showed us in the history of scientific revolutions, you can't change things, but you can find innovators. And so that's all I did. Traveled the world, met the innovators. We spent thousands, seemed like forever, hours of determining a standardized methodology. And then I just had enough you know, I was like a, I was able to by luck be in the position where I could say, okay, that's it, turn the key, and it was locked in, and it's forty years later, it's still locked in, and people still use it, and many people have made their careers and leveraged of it. Many, many of those people who publish data have gone on to be professors at, it's all over the place, actually, and um, created companies, and uh, uh, not surprised to be honest not surprising I, and I, I think it's just begun and and um i think that the it, it's actually much more current today with ai and with the criticality of databases actually than it ever was then so it's kind of been a strange a strange outcome so getting those first few people together was purely your drive to sort of put pieces together because i think yeah. you know, afterwards it's easy i mean once everyone starts seeing there's critical mass I think people understand, but I think doing that first part must have been extraordinarily challenging, like you mentioned. Yeah, it was terrible. And, you know, I would go to conferences and I was only because I had the confidence by having gone through the science degrees and being a medical doctor and and having this, this institute and having collaborators like Steve Koslow um, that I was able to get up at a conference and say, you know, you go to neurology, I mean, just to be frank about it, you go to, and I love neurology, but I did go to neurology and they honestly believe they had a monopoly of wisdom on the brain. And they, because it was so clear what they were doing, it was very deep specialized networks. So to them, the idea of the brain as a highly interconnected dynamical system wasn't as easily tractable as, you know, let's look at the sensory motor processing, which they did a genius job of. But I'd go to a conference and I'd go, Love your sensory motor processing and your ability to determine, you know, epilepsy and these very, very specific things. But, you know, the reality is the brain's trebled in size and most of the brain is not specialized networks. And they would listen and they'd go, who are you? Like, he's like, where did you come? Like, what are you talking about? Like, just let us do this, but you can't do this. You know, nobody else. We are the best. And then I'd go to a psychiatry conference and they'd go, like, what are we should be doing this. We've got psychodynamics behind us. And then I'd go to psychology and they'd go, oh, the, you, the others are such woolly thinkers. And then to be honest, I, knew, I, I was I was actually asked by a television program to do a series on the brain. And I traveled, it, it was uh, SBS television and I did it in a 14 part series. And I traveled the world and filmed the key, some of the key thinkers around the world into the series, Models of the Human Brain, it was called. And when I got to the geneticists, guess what they said? They said, what we're doing is super solid and it's really critical. And all those other people, like they were like a bit loosey-goosey, you know? And I went, wow. Initially, I thought people were kidding. And I coined the term neural epicentricism, that most people I met, I knew, believed that what they were doing was the epicenter for whatever sociological reason that people had to think that. And of course it was because they knew so much about that region that it became sort of lost, like focus, you know, what you are, what you focus on. So, so I really had to get beyond that and find the real innovators who were prepared to take a bet. And then, as you say, once the data started to come in, everything changed Then we couldn't even manage it. You know, we were just a tiny tadpole little group out of nowhere. And, and we didn't have the money or the backing. We got a lot of money in the end, but, which, which, but we didn't have the money in those days to 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 even manage the number of people that wanted access to the database and and you know the usual thing you get the usual opportunistic academics who just you know just the land grabbers and it was tough it was tough dynamics it was tough to get a team a core team that or they were on the same mission and didn't you know and weren't massively opportunistic. It was it was not fun. I, I, I people often ask me, it must have been such fun. No, it was actually wasn't fun at all. It was tremendously challenging and in some ways still is. 
it's a very difficult thing to be whole system. And I think people in every discipline find that when they try and become holistic about it. Yeah, but I think, you know, now that it's like it's there, I think it's nice to see that, you know, that was something you started many years ago and, and has evolved into, I think, a lot of different applications, including, I think, the ring that you and I, <laughs> like my... Yeah, there we go. There we go. Uh, use information that comes from, I think, these uh, databases and information that, that was collected over the years. Right? Um, so this was, um, you said, the University of Sydney, and then you... No, University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Then the institute, yes, was University of Sydney to a Sydney University and Westmead Hospital. Yeah. And then you started uh, Total Brain. Well, no, it's called Brain Resource Company. So Dan Siegel, uh, someone I think you also know, and Dan Siegel and I started, he was a, an account, he was an accountant basically at Citibank. And I think he was like super tired of being a banker. And he had also done physics, had done a, I think a honors degree or master's degree in physics. He didn't do a PhD, I don't think. But anyway, he he was he was a friend of mine, a uh, family friend. And he and I, he, I said, I'm determined to, you know, get external funding for this database. And so he said, you know, I'll, I think I can help you with that. And and um and so he actually left his job to come and be the chief, you know, chief accountant. But he was really the co he was the co-founder of a publicly listed company called the Brain Resource Company, that that was really uh, uh, they would they didn't like my ideas at all. The backers, the the, the people who have initially funded it, they so we we listed as essentially a pharmaceutical trials business. I set up these standardized laboratories. There were thirty of them all over the world, and we sold. Uh, access to these laboratories and our data to pharmaceutical companies for quite a lot of money, but it wasn't a scalable business. But but I never I knew that, we, and that was how we listed. We listed. We got four hundred investors squeaked through uh, the listing in Australia, a tiny company, you know, less than five million dollars. But I envisaged that it would really expand, and so what I did is really create a sort of next phase of that company, which was then called, became called Total Brain. It's called My Brain Solutions. And, and again, everybody hated me doing that because I said, we've got a solid company with pharma trials. What's better than pharma trials? So I said, yeah, what's better than pharma trials is actually what we got set up to what I thought I was setting up, which is this integrative database that became applied integrative neuroscience. You see, we're not just integrative neuroscience, it's the application. And I then started to do stuff online and and um, and started to bring in many, many, many different types of people to um, who could look at the application side of this. In other words, take some of the deep principles that we've been discovering, others, many, I mean, we just were one group, many other groups now are starting to look at the the the, the, the overarching principles of how the brain works. And then think about ways to apply it into uh, behavior change, and that was the, one of the real goals. And then behavior change in mental health and wellness, and even peak performance. So it was across the continuum of take the core insights from a database, add the scientific literature, take the learnings of various products, and apply them into any part of that continuum: mental health, mm -hmm. wellness, peak performance. But the only difference being that whichever part you say, so if you're applying it to mental health, say depression, you focus on negativity bias and you help people become more positive and change their thinking. If you're about wellness, mm -hmm. you focus on the, the five pillars of health. If you're about peak performance, you focus on flow and how you can optimize your performance in critical moments. But the principles on it and the application um, kind of uh, learnings and discipline were the same just with different weightings wow. and many 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 spin-offs have come out of that those principles and that that approach well, absolutely and i think now i think people do understand the value of you know that research and and how you integrate these pieces together right so uh, i remember many many years ago i think this was back i think in 2010 11 or maybe no 2007 or 8 i remember when we first got in touch and you had this uh, device called my Calm Beat. um and i remember i had a, a, an indian name for it called urban pranayam when we were collaborating at that point of time so this was based on uh, your breath right and i think now a lot of people have started to understand 
Uh, there are companies that that look at uh, you know meditation and stress control and all of that. But you did this many years ago. Uh, what was the concept behind that? And maybe if you can explain what that my come beat was all about. Uh, that yeah, moment. it's it's a marvelous example to me of the juxtaposition between the brain and the heart that is basically connected by the vagus nerve. I mean, essentially, we are live brain and heart, brain and body. The brain, we've got these much, the slightly more complicated fundamental principles, of course, but in the body, they're much more simple. There's fight, flight, and there's calm, flexible. Fight, flight, sympathetic, you know, sympathetic system, parasympathetic, calm, flexible, and that's it. Or there's homeostasis, the balance between them with thousands and thousands of little micro mechanisms, but the essence of it is that. So with my heart background, I saw that to get a found by luck, and again, this is one of those examples that had um, initially had nothing to do with me. Most, many of the deepest insights came were learnings from others. And this particular learning, they were learning from others that I adapted into the standardization and then found I'm a sort of MVP builder. And then I created an MVP, which then was, and in fact, funny enough, that is still very much alive for reasons I'll tell you. So there's a marvelous man in San Diego called uh, Richard Gewurz, Dick Gewurz. He's at Allianz University, and he was the president of the American Biofeedback Society. And him and another colleague of mine uh, who actually discovered variability in heartbeat, that very, uh, Stephen Porges, that is. Stephen Porges discovered that the vagus has gone through multiple evolutionary steps, and he helped people understand the importance of the variability Mm. of heart rate as a reflection of switching on this calm and flexible system. Now, what happened was uh, d d there was a Russian, it's a very interesting story, actually, I'll try to be very brief, but there's a Russian uh, 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 engineer in the, astro in the, in the, pro uh, the astronaut program um, who discovered in a Russian astronaut that he, he had learned meditation and he did a fast Fourier transform on his heartbeat. The Russians have got amazing heart rate databases. Mm -hmm. And he, he basically, to cut a long story short, found that there's a specific breathing rate at six breaths per minute, where the calm, flexible system, the vagus, puts a break on your fight flight system. Mm -hmm. And Richard Gewurz and his other colleagues, uh, um, Paul Lira, I think, who in, another massive guru in uh, HIV, and Julian Thayer, somehow they persuaded Evgeny to come to immigrate to the United States, and they helped popularize and expand and research deeply this idea that there is a resonance, not about breath only, but there is a resonance that at the specific breath, six breaths a minute, the brain... And the vagus, with the, the vagus is just the 10th nerve coming out of the brain, puts a break on your fight flight system for real. So here on we had, and that the way you do it is by just breathing at six breaths per minute. So here we had the simplest possible mechanism to connect brain and body and to add to the marvelous 2,500 year old ideas that came out of the East and out of India and out of meditating gurus. Um, to add to that marvelous wisdom and insight, because they knew about slow breath, you know, thousands of years before Western medicine did. And to add this bit of science that says, if you're going to meditate, you may also want to have one option to breathe at six breaths a minute and further activate your break on your fight flight stress system. And then what I did, I learned that and was a student at their feet, to be honest. And then all I did was connect the dots more deeply to the brain, the brain, the brain's electrical brain function, seeing how the brain recruits networks. There's a whole lot of way things that that kind of coalesce when you're in a calm, flexible state. Um, studied Herbert Benson from Harvard, who was a cardiologist, to show that any stimulus that's repetitive is going to put you into a calm state. And then all I did was turn that into a product, which is to very quickly measure your heart rate. It was a little ear clip at the time. Now we're going to do it with this mm -hmm. band, but it's the same idea. And get you to breathe at different rates. It, it, you're going to have a resonance, a perfect optimal breathing rate. 
that gets all of these things to overlap your brain function your your heart your your lung function your all the various resonances uh, blood pressure it's very linked to optimal blood pressure control um so all you've got to do is calculate everybody has a slightly different resonance rate so we just put them through different breathing rates calculate where they have the maximum heart rate variability the more variable you are the more you are in fight flight in calm the less variable your heart beats the more stressed you are and that's it and we calculated that i turned it into a product and people loved it and still love it and now we're just going to do a more uh, sort of a more uh, uh, sort of current one mm -hmm. using the current versions of heart rate variability in bands and stuff rather than in an ear clip but the principle and the and i'll just give you one last point about again when you get it right how it scales i created not only a product to do that but i created a free app that just got people to breathe at six breaths per minute and i tell you i know we never advertised it was just a free app on um, my brain solutions in those days before it became total brain there were over a million downloads around the world oh. And it's just because, you know, I was in an airport a number of times and I'd walk past and I'd go, my God, that's my little visual on their computer. And it would be my combat. Absolutely. You know, when something works, people know it, they can feel it and it's quick. And that's the way all behavior change should be. You know, if I had to summarize this entire podcast and my learnings in, in, in this minute, I'd say that when I put everything together over 40 years, all the hundreds of papers and stuff, at the end of the day, there are a small number of things that you can see immediately work and they're easy to understand and they can potentially change the way people break their conditioned thinking and their fears of change and they'll do it and they'll see the benefits straight away and it'll stick. And that is one of them. So getting it to the right, I think, uh, right beat at the right time. But um... One thing that, I mean, you mentioned, talked about uh, heart rate variability. Maybe if you can explain, you, you mentioned that, you know, when it is lesser, it means your, your heart is more stressed. But if you can just explain what actually happens, uh, what, is, what is heart rate variability for, for people? Sure, sure. So, you know, most people think that your heart beats at once per second, and that's really healthy, right? It turns out when I was a young medical student and we were delivering babies you were measuring the baby's heart rate if the baby's heart rate was rhythmical it was in trouble it had a cord around its neck and we would have to go in and often and you know just get it out because it's a sign of ill health think about it why are we here speaking to each other in an evolutionary sense from mrs players to us why hmm. because we know in this brain we are massively good at adapting and adapting in real time, adapting over time. How do you adapt? You adapt through variation. You adapt through change and an ability to, to switch in the moment for safety reasons. So if you just keep doing the same thing, you will not adapt. So the body has evolved that at every level. When it's too consistent, like if your heartbeat is too consistent, it is a sign of ill health. Mm -hmm. Now, if your heartbeat is variable because you've got the fight flight system, that the beats, instead of being every second, they like could be every 0.8 of a second and then 1.1 second. So you have this boom, 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 versus if it's in stress, boom, boom, boom. Why? Because when you're in real stress, acute life threatening stress, you want to get oxygen to your muscles and just get out of there. So it works for real threatening stress. But if you want to be calm and you want to have a flexible mindset and think flexibly, you want to be in that calm, flexible, vagus nerve state. And you want to be, and that will allow you to be flexible in your thinking. And it'll allow, and that 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 principle of flexible in your thinking is the essence of, of why the brain is so good at switching on the heartbeat, reflecting in the heartbeat. And it also is a way of controlling blood pressure. By changing the heartbeat in this flexible way, you can stabilize your blood pressure. So when you stand up, you don't fall over. So there's lots of mechanisms, but that's the best sort of summary I can give in short time as to the sorts of processes involved. Well, I think that's a very nice way of explaining it, you know, how how the 
heart needs to adapt to different conditions. And I think it's a true for, for, for all of us, right? We go through different situations in life and I think higher variable, heart rate variability is good for you. Um, and higher brain function variability on it as well. I mean, that's the key to it, both together. They work so, sing and that's why it's called resonance. They literally come into resonance, the heart and the brain. Yeah, so I think uh, one thing that we have started to see is that a lot of heart rate variability is used now in wearables, right? Uh, where they are saying, uh, you know, you can understand stress and you can understand what is going on. Uh, so basically they're seeing if there is low heart rate variability, that means you're more stressed versus when there is a higher higher heart rate variability. Is that correct? 100%. And again, yeah, the evolution's been pretty quick. So all of these watches, I, I, I watch and all of them, they all do it, but they're not really dedicated to doing that variability all day. We work with the most sophisticated way of doing that. And I'll tell you why it's a sort of crucial part of the mix. So it's a company called Felix and, uh, and Travis Wild did five years of machine learning with these companies so that you can get every six seconds, you get a an indication of your level of stress mm. through your heart rate variability score. So when I wear this all day and all night, you can see your stress levels throughout the day in real time. Now, why is that so critical, Anu? So this is how the field has evolved, right? Mm. Why it's so critical is I can give somebody resonant breathing, breathe at six breaths per minute, or mindful meditation, or yoga, repeat any movement, even Tai Chi, um, or um, CBT, or a drug like ketamine, which is my next podcast will be on that. Like, and you can see immediately the extent to which you have improved your stress in real time. Now, as I came back to the initial principles, why do people not change? Because nobody's shown them how they benefit in real time. Like, how do I know this is working? And that's where the whole field seems to be moving to, Anu. In the moment, in real time, objective measures. You know, a lot of people don't like the technology. They feel it's, in, it's, it's, it's sort of distracting. It's too many bells and whistles. But not when it's like that. When it's telling you something that informs your core sense of self mm. and gives you self um, sort of confidence that what you're doing is worth it. Nothing is more powerful than that. So there's a field of biometrics that is adding now to bring the brain body system into focus about what works, how to personalize. And that's no different to why I think genetics is such a a sort of other side of this coin. Look at the whole evolution of genetics, how the personalization. Have you seen the same pattern, Anu, in, in genetics moving from these big scale ideas to like hyper personalization? Absolutely. And I was going to say that, you know, I, when we were discussing about stress also, I think some people are naturally more inclined to be stressed. And I think that's part of their genetic makeup, right? Uh, so I think it would be very helpful for people to understand that if they are, it is okay, but if you know how to counter it, and I think that's true of any lifestyle dis disease or any any problem that you may have, because it's not about knowing that you have something that is, that's how you were initially wired, but that you can change that, right? I think, and, and the fact that you can understand it, um, and I think I, I read one of your quotes that said, uh, knowledge is the only, uh, you know, uh, solution. I mean, to that effect, I think maybe I'm I'm not saying it right, but basically saying that if you have the knowledge of of what you need to, uh, you know, fix, then you can do it. If you don't know, then you can't do it. So if you want to personalize something, I think the knowledge of your genetics at that point is extremely helpful. And I think putting that together with the knowledge that you have of what is going on right now with your stress levels, what is going on with, you know, your current uh, state where you are, I think then you are able to personalize it so much better, right? And I think that's what I find it so beautiful about, you know, putting these pieces together, uh, giving people that knowledge about how things get connected, I think will help people understand and and, and I think as we simplify this further, I think people are more likely to to take it to the next level. Yeah, that's beautifully put on you know so the only other element we've just sort of added to that is just to formalize a plan 
to formalize a plan so that firstly, you know, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. So that's why measuring, knowing your genetics mm -hmm. means that you're starting to know yourself at this deeper level. And even people say, yeah, but do I want to know if I've got a risk for stress? Hell yeah, you do. Because you know then that you need to focus on that stress. But on the other hand, you know where your strengths are. So knowing your own strengths and limitations is part of the plan. Mm -hmm. And that helps you get more ready to change. Because if you know you've got a bit of a stress challenge, you're more likely to become more ready to go, okay, I'll do this. So the first step in the plan, having a plan, is readiness and knowing your why. And then the second step, the most crucial step, is to rewire it. Because knowledge alone is critical for the first step. But for the second step, it's about having very small, granular steps. Why? Because why do people not change? People not ch don't change because they're scared of failing. Because fight, flight, uh, you know, the key organizing principle of the brain is safety. And if you don't feel safe that you're going to win, that means you're going to lose. And people do not like losing. And so that the plan has to be so simple and so small steps that they, it's hard to fail. So the small steps, like let's say it's resonant breathing or a bit of meditation or both together or a bit of meditation and some movement with Tai Chi, the three together, let's just say that. And you do it like for real mm -hmm. multiple times a day and in a systematic manner in the morning and in the evening. You rewire, literally rewire, and you have it. And we are just the composite of habits. So the second step of a plan, readiness, and measurability, small steps. And then the third step, of course, is to make sure that you consolidate that habit and turn it into a lifestyle, transfer it. Mm -hmm. And with a plan, knowledge, applied knowledge, becomes an actionable likelihood to rewire your brain. And you know, I know it sounds simple to people, I know, but I have seen over the last 40 years that when people have a plan that is personalized and specific and granular, and they stick with the first 30 days to get the initial wiring done, and then just deepen it, start thinking about ways to what's called habit stack. So, you know, instead of just breathing, you do breathing and maybe mantras, breathing mantras and visualizations, you know, you just deepen they can rewire anything, like literally. There is no reason that neural networks that fire together, wire, to wire together. It's just basic. It's like there is the, the principles are not that complicated. The complexity is fear. And the fear is failure. And that will hijack almost anything. But isn't failure supposed to be the the best teacher, but people don't want to get there. <laughs> That's a really good point, Anu. It's a very critical point. So let's just think about that a little further. Let's unpack that a bit. Failure is the best teacher. But if it's toxic failure, mm. it's not the greatest teacher. It's failure is like in Silicon Valley. What made Silicon Valley Silicon Valley? It was iterative optimization. It was rapidly learning. Mm. It's carrying forward our learnings. And it's the same with stress. Stress is marvelous. I mean, without stress, we'd be dead. As I said, without knowing when to put on stress to give us a bit of motivation, a bit of focus, get us to, that's stress is, we don't talk about good stress enough. But then there comes a point where if you've got a negative thought that's harming you, and we have 50,000 thoughts a day, and that negative thought, like let's say it's, an, it's a negative thought about you, you negatively feel you know, you've got self-limiting beliefs and you keep thinking about those self-limiting beliefs rather than your opportunities and your strengths. And all of those 50,000 thoughts or many of them are contaminated by that self-limiting belief. That stress is super toxic. And then if it starts becoming more and more negative and magnified negative about yourself, your work, the world, mm -hmm. that's the basis for depression. So the principles are very simple and, and therefore the key thing is to switch to dopamine. Like, what is it that gives you joy? What is it that can break that negative thought in a realistic way? And the way to do that is small, tiny, tiny. The brain loves winning and it doesn't always need to win big. In fact, it, winning small will keep it there, you know, it, it, just like winning big will. And so we know that winning small is likely to win. And so you, it's changing the structure and the way that you break 
the repeated patterns and just rewire in a simple way. You've got to feel the benefit in the moment, but you also have to see the compound benefit emerging of a new habit, choosing yourself. And I've never seen deeper fun or people get more pleasure out of rewiring themselves, for real, and being who they want to be rather than this conditioned, sometimes homogenized, and especially if it starts getting negative toxic impacts, it's very frustrating for people, very suffocating. And so there are always doorways out of that. And it's just a matter of, um, of you know, embracing some of the science to open those doors. I, I agree. I mean, I've, um, you know, like I'm learning a new language, right? And one of the things I found very useful was exactly that, right? I'm getting daily wins for that, right? I mean, I do it a little bit. I don't spend a lot of time doing it. But I know that at the end of the day, I'm going to learn a new language. It is exciting to be able to go somewhere and be able to talk about, uh, I mean, learn a new language. But I think every day, the way the apps are currently structured will allow you to be able to say, ah, you won today. You finished your chapter. I think it's the same thing when it comes to stress and other things. I've started seeing, I think the first time I remember doing the whole my calm beat and everything else, trying to figure out how do you measure and how do you, you know, overcome that? I think it became a habit for me on a regular basis. And now I think we, you know, just like you, I think we, I'm also transitioning into other ways of measuring this in more simpler, more easier ways to do it. But I feel that, you know, understanding the why, as you said, uh, and I think that's where genetics comes into play, play, right? Because you can understand why you do certain things. Um, Absolutely. I don't, what language are you using? Just, just by the way, what language are you learning? I'm learning French. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Just, just one other example. I just want to mention because it's so ubiquitous now. And living near Silicon Valley and just being part of a AI community has just struck me so much in the last few months. You know, AI is going to help people personalize what we've just said. Mm -hmm. And so one of the other companies I helped, um, it was a marvelous man called, I think you know, and you've tried what he's done, John Batale, which is music, sound and music, called Brain Music Labs. And 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 so, for example, so he's got a resonant breathing, like a mic on beat, but a different one for each day. Not a different rate, but a different sound, a different visual. But the point is, I'm just giving an example. So if you put a chatbot on that, and you take our conversation so far, and you put that as the gad, you know, as the content for the chatbot, and then people could sit and ask questions. How do I do this in the early phase? How do I do that in week two when this is where most people give up? And they ask questions of the chatbot that are essentially content on the sort of discussions we're having. Then I think that's also going to be another helpful way, a new and helpful dimension to keep people on track, whether it's for brain music labs, resonant brain sort of states, whether it's anything. And, and the more we can personalize, the better. And then I think people start, I think you'll see in the next years or so, you'll see a, a broader amount of people um, getting into genetics because then they're going to see that it's all subserving the same goal, which is personal empowerment. And I think initially genetics were, for the first movers, they were there, of course, as usual. And then some of them started to have, you know, skepticism, but what the so what? What's the so what? Well, that's the so what, that the empowerment of genetics flows on to this because the truth is that you know between 30 and 50 percent depending on what specific issue it, it, we are genetics are not our destiny but that we ignore them at our peril and so i've always been fascinated in this 40 years i knew how long it's taken genetics to be fully embraced and in, in fact sought after the way that it started to become now for good reason and i think with these behavior change models, I think the genetic clicking is going to just become a further escalation of, of empowering people. So they can see the so what straight away. Absolutely. And I think, you know, initially when we started Map My Genome, for instance, I think people were not, they didn't understand that, you know, why we would do something that is probabilistic and say, you know, you, you're giving a, a risk assessment, right? So we never said that, you know, this means you have a disorder. Or, or you have a problem, but it is more that this is sort of a risk predisposition. 
and that you can actually change this by behavior change. You can change it by lifestyle changes, which are essentially behavior changes, right? How you eat, how you exercise and all of that. And all of that, I think, also can be guided by your principles in terms of how do you create those habits in terms of lifestyle? Uh, how do you sleep better? How do you eat better? Uh, but it, most people find it very difficult to, to make those changes, right? Uh, so they say, you know, you're telling me that I need to uh, sleep better because that sort of changes a lot of the way things happen in my gut, a lot of things that um, my you know, blood pressure will be better, my diabetes will be better, but how do I get to doing those things? And I think that's where, I think your whole principles of from knowing to, to doing and, and the plan that you mentioned uh, come in. Uh, so maybe if you can summarize, how do people change how they eat and how they sleep? And, and Yeah, well, it's really as much your model as it is Ours, I, knew, I mean, you, you know, working with Map My Genome and, uh, you know, one of the things we're doing together is creating a, a integrated report that can tell people about, so let's take the pillars of health, right? So we have this pillars of health program online that's calm, move, eat, connect and sleep. Mm-hmm. Now, the beauty of the genetics, <clears throat> it's a part of the plan is, again, seeing, okay, so what are my strengths and weaknesses? And we have simple ways to measure that, but let's take the genetics specifically. So now in the genetics, you can start seeing, well, what am I eating, right? And and what am I more likely to benefit from eating in certain foods, mm-hmm. certain ways? Exercise, there are genetic information about each of these issues, sleep, um, even predisposition to resilience. You want to know if you've got a, res- a predisposition to not be resilient, you want to be a little more open to knowing that you may have to just be aware that you need to think about the way you bounce back and not give up too easily. So there's this bringing all of this together is the key and making it simple, which is why it's been such a joy to work with you. You take, I mean, I've used all your reports, the reports on each one of these, and some people like to dive deep. I do. Many people do. But some people also want the shortcut and they want a quick summary, which is what we're also giving them in Map My, the Map My Genome report, the integrated report. So the point of change. So the issue with change is this. Let's take eating, which is the one of the most contentious ways. So stress is easy because we've got so many ways where people can change their stress in the moment. And we've discussed some of them. But let's discuss eating. So everybody knows, you know, Mediterranean diet, or the increasingly, and of course in India, the greatest, the greatest uh, country in the world for veganism and vegetarianism. And but the problem is change. Let's look at the um, the power of conditioning. I mean, we've got a massive industrial complex that has addicted us, just like social media addicts us to the most remarkably weird, you know, fear buttons and FOMO buttons, fear of missing out buttons. The industrial complex of food has addicted us to SOS, to sugar, oil, and salt. And I am one of those people who is massively addicted, massively addicted to sugar in particular, oil and salt. And so talk about the gap between knowing and doing, which is the name of my book and of of my podcast, the the brain from knowing to doing. I knew knew quite a lot about addiction and quite a lot about my sugar addiction, which was fueled by my stress. I'd come home after these days in the Brain Institute or even more so once we became a publicly listed company and it was kind of like very difficult to satisfy everybody and to try and get investors to be a little bit more long range versus the you know traders these and of course all of that is on me because you've got to you've got to satisfy all of those domains it's very stressful so i'd come home at night and i'd go i just deserve to have my sugar hit so what's my point about that my point about that is it took me a long time yeah. to actually a, recognize what an addict I was in terms of sugar. I was addict in lots of things. I was taking sleeping tablets. I was an addict to salt as well. Um, I, was a, I was a work addict. So there are a lot of addictions, right? So how did I actually start? And I'm, I'm don't not one of those people. I'd love to say that practice what I preach, but I don't. I'm trying. I'm certainly. But I've seen in thousands of people now. And we've got, you know, over 1.4 million people have used our, our, the, our, our central program in Total Brain. Um, But I've seen that for some people, it is just a matter of, so let's take diet, which is not 
that's part of more like the thing that we do at the American Heart Association. But I've looked at so many diets and worked and helped people with so many diet programs. They don't work that well. And the reason they don't work that well is people get confusing information. So now we're in an era, though, where with AI, it's going to be worse because the information is going to be more distorted and more complicated. But you know what? There's, there's, there's something else happening in AI. AI can sweep the entire literature and it can start sending you references and it can start telling you what has been validated. So we can start seeing for real what is and isn't, where's the evidence, and we can start checking it ourselves. So there's an AI, just a one example of many. One of the people I know developed a program called Questy, Q-U-E-S-T-Y dot AI. So it's just like GPT-4, mm. but with references. That's and it actually reads the papers and then summarizes them. Now, all I'm saying on is that the first thing about diet is people can start seeing for themselves where the real evidence is. How do they get away from the SOS addictions? And they can start trialing other things. I, You know what, Anna, it's embarrassing to tell you I didn't like vegetables. And I'm, as you know, I'm a vegan. Oh, you're a vegan, yeah. And But to get from being a meat SOS food junkie to not, and the point I'll end off with is saying this, it's not just that I'm a vegan. It's that I love the taste of natural food. I, it's, to me, I'm shocked that I was able to be so easily hijacked. Well, I'm not shocked because there's lots of evolutionary reasons why we get so easily addicted to sugar and fat and salt. Okay. But nevertheless, when people say to me, why are you a vegan? I say lots of reasons, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you the most important one that I would tell you if you're super skeptical is taste. Mm -hmm. Food has never tasted more interesting and more fulfilling than natural food. So what I'm saying is a lot of this is a finding what works. I'm not saying people, I'm not pushing veganism. I'm just saying that I'm giving a personal example, but also a research example that people need to find what works for them. For most people, Mediterranean diets work. But for many people, other diets work that are, in my opinion, somebody who's partially been involved in the world of, of heart disease seems crazy. Like massive meat and I'm sorry, but I will be surprised if in, and, but the data could be wrong. And it's a great way to lose weight for some people, but there are clearly strange fad ways of eating that maybe are not that healthy. Um, but don't take my opinion from it. Just go to the American you know, the Heart, the Heart Association or the president of the American Cardiac Society, Kim Williams. Just look up Kim Williams. Mm -hmm. Listen to what he says. He says there are two types of cardiologists. They're cardiologists who practice cardiology and they're cardiologists who read the literature. And his point was that in an era when there is, it's not me, that's Kim Williams. You should hear him. He's a vegan. He says in an era where stress and inflammation are clearly massively underpinning many of the chronic illnesses that we have. And another last example, another company that I work with quite closely, marvelous little company called uh, Brainspan. It measures omega-3 and 6. Now, if your omega-3 is not very high, I mean, 60% of our brain around every nerve cell is fat. And it's fatty, fatty tissue, you know, fatty acids. And omega-3 is a very critical part of the health of every one of our neurons and also the neuronal flexibility and function. So if your omega-3 level is not high enough mm -hmm. and you have a lot of high omega-6, which is processed food related, I've got a big problem. So, you know, I just look for all the things that are where there's evidence of which omega-3-6 in diet is one of them. And the brain span is a little pinprick. You get your numbers. You then go on to a better diet. You take 1,500 of omega-3 uh, every day capsules. I take two capsules, two uh, vegan capsules. And it's shocking how you can, how much healthier you are three months later. It's shocking. You just little pinprick, you see it, you see it in real life in a beautiful little report. So these are the ways I think, Anu, we're bringing it all together with these simple metrics. And of course, with genetics, I know you've become involved with a company that does gene expression. So we can even see to what extent, not only have you been empowered by the information, but to what extent have you switched off the bad genes and switched on the good genes. I mean, this was unimaginable 40 years ago when I started on all of these pieces. And yet, 
they are simply expansions of the same handful of principles mm -hmm. and the essence takeaway of your i'm sorry for such a long answer to such a short question but the essence is find what works for you and find the principles you know um, i would suggest you know that people not do not get too sideshowed by the fads find the principles find the experts like kim williams the you know president of the american heart society i believe and people like him um there are many people um and you can spot them quickly because they're not you know they've got the data and they've got the science and they're very good at distilling that science and providing it to people and then use the ai judiciously bring all that together starts getting interesting in terms of where is the path and i could state the same thing for if we've done it for stress mm -hmm. we've talked about diet i would say the same thing about exercise and types of exercise and that in a brain point of view i know it's not just about you know, it's not just about, you know, how large your pecs are, but, or how, you know, how much weight you've lost, but there's an incredible benefit of exercise and movement to brain function and increased neural connections and timing. You know, I'm always shocked again, like resonant breathing, where people are going to exercise, why not exercise with timing? Doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. Like, why would you just go through the motions, pump more iron or do more repetitions with timing? You take that Herbert Benson process and you turn it into a kind of meditation as well. So there are all these little things, sleep, of course, and last but not least, social connection. Shelley Carson, the most wonderful collaborator as well, who is at Harvard, and she's the social connection person in our program. And just marvelous how powerful quality social connection is, the antithesis of social media in some ways. Social media has its place, but um, so those things are simple principles. It's almost like we're going back to basics, mm -hmm. but they're not simple basics and they're not simplistic. They're simple because they it's like the laws of the universe. You know, if you speak to a physicist and you look at the four primary forces in the universe, they don't go, oh, that's too simple. They go, no, that is, they are the fundamental principles of the universe yeah we don't exactly know how quantum and newtonian physics connect together but these are the four forces you know take it or leave it uh you can doubt it but good luck on that so there's deep principles in the brain and in brain body function that have emerged lots of details we don't know a huge amount we don't understand but there's a lot we do about the essence of what's going on Oh, ab absolutely. I think you've, you've summarized all of these pieces together. I know that uh, how I've changed also, I think I've, I use your techniques many ways to, to actually make those changes. Um, and sometimes I think it is, you know, I've, I've, I'm trying this with my daughter, for instance, and I think she has come to a stage where she has understood why um, she is willing to try to change certain, you know, behavior. And so what I've done is, I said, and I think you mentioned that, you know, how do you get good stuff into your diet, for instance, but maybe work on the taste a little bit because that's ultimately your your reward in some form. So get the vegetables, but also maybe add something that will enhance the taste, get them used to that a little bit. And then over a period of time, I think, uh, get to a point where they themselves start enjoying that as a reward itself. Like you said, when you are a vegan, you started enjoying your your natural foods, the taste of natural foods over a period of time. And I was yeah. a junkie as well. <laughs> so yes, I know yes. that I've gotten gotten rid of that habit as well. You know, no, I want to just add one final piece to this equation because it's the one that sort of has shocked me the most and it's the one I'm the worst at. I'm bad at most, a lot of things, but this one I'm the worst at. You know, as an extrovert, an ENFP extrovert, I'm always loving to share and I'm kind of loving to share what I know with people. And so I remember, and 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 um, I, uh, this is kind of quite personal to me, my family, because I, I really wanted my, for example, I have five grandchildren now, and I'd love them to sort of eat, you know, in a, in a, sort of like start thinking about eating the way I do. But of course, when you tell anybody, whether it's a child or whether it's an adult, if you tell them what to do, mm -hmm. there's somehow in the brain, there's a strange thing where they have a natural pushback. And so there's this entire field of communication called motivational interviewing, whereby instead of telling people what to do, you give them the chance to choose for themselves so that they own it. 
because the brain, if it owns it, it's feeling safe because it's choosing it. There's something about safety when you tell someone what to do. So they're feeling unsafe. They're going like, like seriously, who are you to tell me anything? Kind of thing. It's very shocking to me, Anna, when I was a young medical student and I used to tell people they needed to lose weight because they got terrible cholesterols and they really were sick, some of them, like very sick. And they'd say, oh, thank you, doctor. It's so helpful. And I'd come and see them a few weeks later and they, they'd done nothing. And I'd go like, well, seriously, what is going on? And they'd say, I, I, I try, it's, it's useless. And then I discovered motivational interviewing. And instead of saying to them, you know, in fact, I remember even with one man, I brought his two young daughters into the room because he was dying. He had Raynaud's disease and he was smoking, actually. He couldn't give up smoking. And I said, okay, you know, your children are not going to, I mean, I was super inappropriate. Your children are going to have a father if you continue like this. It didn't, it didn't matter. It didn't it, it, He was a lovely man, a very educated man too. Motivational interviewing was just simply saying, Look, I don't know if you're gonna if you're capable of doing this, but here are three options. Which option would you choose? As a small step, you know, with a bit of a plan. And I was shocked on it at the difference. It may sound small, but to me it was not small. And they're big industries that have now been created around this idea. And with nudging, you know, non-conscious nudging people, which is a whole different discussion. But if people haven't read the book Nudge, and today is a very special day, by the way, Daniel Kahneman the founder of understanding the non-conscious brain died at the age of 90. Marvelous, marvelous man. And the book called Nudge was one of his students who wrote that, or his book, many people might have read it, Thinking Fast or Slow. But we have a hundred biases, I knew a hundred. Seriously? So unless you understand your biases, you are just walking around in the dark. So anyway, the bias of fear is huge. And so telling, capturing these biases in nudge and feeding people in motivational interviewing these choices, and then they make the choice. They own. And then all you are is the guide on the side. You go, oh, oh well done. Didn't think you could do it, but hey, well, probably. and that process is a skill. It's a strategy, but it's a good one. And it's based on very sound, deep, brain principle because let's not forget that most of our brain is non-conscious we so when i say there's a lot we don't know there's a lot we don't we are we are you know we overestimate our rational abilities and underestimate how much our brains can get hijacked and how much of our intuition matters and that's not me saying that that's you know einstein literally said that that we overestimate our rational abilities and underestimate the real gift, which is our intuition. And we don't use it enough and we don't trust it enough. Now we can trust it inappropriately. So there are ways to bring it, but the essence of integration, Anu, is mm -hmm. integrating, bringing together the non-conscious intuition and our conscious rational thinking. And that to me is the ultimate key of the most healthy, the most effective, the best well people, the people who break through in mental health, the people who are most well, and the people who are peak performers. What I've seen that is unifying across that, the principle that is most unifying, or the more people can bring together their non-conscious intuition and their conscious rational thinking. And instead of seeing them as polar opposites, they harmonize them. That to me is the ultimate key that I've seen that works the most effectively. It's a, it's a marker that someone is in the right direction. So we will, if you allow me to have another podcast on all the 90 biases that we mentioned, because I think that itself is, is fascinating because I think- A hundred biases, over a hundred. Over a hundred biases. Yeah. It's unbelievable. When you go through them, and I'm, I'm happy to spend as long as like, I can choose the top 10, top 20, top 30, a hundred. And when you hear them and you listen to them and you see Daniel Kahneman, mm. he was the best. I'm sorry he died because he was the best explainer in the world of most of them. But okay. nudge, the book nudge. But when you translate them in the way that we're talking about, like, you know, then you hear them and you listen to them. It's, it's one of the most game-changing things I've ever seen in people's lives when they actually realize 
that most of what they do is just simply a bias and that has been very conditioned mm -hmm. and it's very hard to break conditioning why what's the principle of that neural networks that fire together wire together so when i went and told my grandchildren that they should eat their vegetables their the rainbow they eat your rainbow every day well right. does that does that, does that turn into them doing no but if i had said what is your it just is so i can't believe how stupid i was after all these years all i had to do right off the bat was what is your favorite color mm -hmm. what is your favorite vegetable how does it take i mean i'm embarrassed almost telling the story because and my children if they ever hear this podcast will laugh fall over laughing <laughs> because they'll go that's not what you did at all now how did i not do that i, I just think i was so keen to share the knowledge and help that i missed the spot the step of you know it's it's like a, it's the oddest thing on it and it's the oddest thing that's that's nothing is easy you know it's just not that easy it's not easy but it's doable if, if you super want. doable yeah super super doable and sometimes I, you get it right the second time you know not all the third time so i i like what you said you know when you're talking to children then instead of saying you should eat your vegetables you are asking what is your favorite color and what vegetable do you like so then you're focusing their attention in some yeah. giving them choices what's your best taste yeah let's take a whole range and divide those that you don't like the taste of and those that you do and then if people like something they're more likely to experiment in other things i mean it's so simple it's remarkable you know i really think simplicity is one of the most underrated things but there's so much confusion on it and there's so many, and all the celebrity kind of information and this clickbait uh, playing and the magnification of fear and the magnification of peculiar and the magnification of fear of missing out is just distorting our ability to just communicate in a rather straightforward way. It's not, there's nothing to blame. It's all part of the gig, right? But it's it's surprising how much that... Uh, how much or to, to just see through that. And I'll tell you one other element. I said motivational interviewing be the last piece, but there is one sort of lesson, other lesson that comes to mind with a, from a friend of mine, um, Chris Darwin, who's Charles Darwin's great, great grandson. And he, he reminds me that Charles Darwin used to challenge his confirmation bias. So the confirmation bias that we want to find information that we know that agrees with our bias so if you're a negative person you'll find negative stuff and if you're a positive person you will scan around and challenging that confirmation bias he he tells me is something that his great great grandfather did every day in every way with every bit of information he ever got now if you just think of that it's you know, it's a long time ago and now if you even think about someone slightly longer than that, Socrates, 2,500 years ago, mm -hmm. he was doing something very similar. What happened? It's not that complicated, but it takes a discipline to do because we've been so conditioned into homogenized thinking and without the full information set or the information sets that have been slightly distorted in a biased way. So I think, but what you did when you started off was you found the path out of that that bias, right? When you're starting the whole database, putting these things. That was the goal, was to come out of the bias, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Evie, one thing, uh, can you give us some examples of, or one example at least, of what is the biggest myth in your in your opinion? And I mean, the most common one is that we only use 10% of our brain. And of course, we now know that there's, you know, 85 billion neurons and they all have a life and they're all functioning all the time and firing all the time, depending on what inputs and outputs they are. So that's one of the biggest myths. Um, but there's a deeper myth, I think, that are interesting that I'll just rather uh, focus on, um, which is one that we sort of covered in habits, which is that it's not just about what you know, but it's about um, all that being motivated but it's about really rewiring, having a plan for rewiring. I think that's one of the deepest myths that knowledge alone is not enough. Mm. You need to have. And then the second myth is that, you know, we are such rational brains, which we're not. It's that combination. So a big myth is that 
emotions are bad yeah. and that ir irrational is good emotions and intuition have a tremendously synergistic effect and and i think that's a myth that is slowly being debunked that you only put them all together and the last myth i'd say is that you know, many people think it's what we do in the long run that matters you know we let's be rational in the long run and build a habit about thinking strategically but it seems like the brain is really operating in real time in seconds like in one second actually it takes one fifth of a second and we've measured this to actually have those biases impact on whether we are fearful or whether we think something's rewarding or something is 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 fear invoking a fifth of a second and then within about half a second, we're consciously aware of it. So we really are when people like Eckhart Tolle and all of our spiritual leaders talk about being present and in the moment, they're not kidding. It's just that it's literally in the second. We should have called it being the second. And I love that probably is what they meant, presence and being in the moment. So the myth of the brain is sort of let's think about it generally, I think is being contracted to mm -hmm let's be super appreciative of what happens within the moment as in one second and how important i think that's going to be to magnify the criticality of understanding these biases and our intuitions as much as we do our longer term rational thinking so from from using our brain as the, the whole brain there's no such a thing as 10 percent nothing it's a full brain body system it's not about what we know in the brain. It's about when. It's timing. That the brain, above all, is a timing system. I'd say they some of the sort of myths and simplistic thinking that is becoming more informed by the integrated, applied integrated neuroscience that is showing the dynamics of the system and about the timing. Wow. I think that's a great way of, of putting all these pieces together. You also mentioned you have the non-conscious part of the brain and the conscious part of the brain. But if they're not harmonized, then you can, you know, you a rash, rational thinking person, if they're angry, can make wrong decisions. People who you know might not be harmonized might be doing stupid things, which when they think in a more calm state, might not actually do that. Right? We also talked about genetics, epigenetics how uh, environment and lifestyle make changes in terms of how your brain is wired. And I think some of those are exemplified by some of the studies that have been done on you know, meditation uh, and others. So your genetic code is not changing. But I think the fact that what you do with it in terms of doing meditation, I think some of the large studies have shown that your epigenetics is what is changing, which is what you mentioned as the expression of whether the genes are turned on or off. And it's all because of what you what you do with your brain. You know, people shouldn't stop thinking of the brain as a different piece uh, and, and the body as a different piece, your genetics differently and, and so on. What you have done is, is outstanding in terms of putting all those pieces together, helping us understand in very simple terms uh, what does it each mean without having to read your, you know, all the big books that you've written. I think you've distilled it down to very easy things for people to do. So thank you for, for, for doing all of, all of that for everyone. So, so the thousands of people are doing it. And I, just one of the, the, the sort of conduits of distilling it to the takeaway message that I keep saying to myself every day is don't forget how interconnected. It's not just an interconnected universe we live in. There's a universe between our ears mm -hmm. and between our ears and our body that is super interconnected. And that interconnection as a timing system is so empowering once you see that, once you no longer see your body as just these pieces, but as this remarkable cosmos that is operating in fractions of a second, mm -hmm. it's like one of the greatest transformative ideas and you start getting a different level of respect for what you're doing how many of your 50,000 thoughts did you change today how many did you let run loose and become manifesting and magnified in their negative toxicity how many did you switch to a positive solution focused thought and um, what did you put in your mouth what came out of your mouth what control did you have over this remarkable dynamical cosmos it's a it's a just an amazing kind of a uh, different context to the the kind of simplifications that are that i think existed not not so long ago now let's move on to another aspect that you you've done a lot of research on 
and and that is depression. And so there's clearly a difference between clinical level depression and, and normal depression. Why do you think that collaborative care is the right approach to treating depression? Because it, I mean, clearly depression is a, a big problem across the world. And, and I think more so it became uh, much more obvious during the pandemic. Why did you get started in this whole space of depression? Um, and why do you think that, you know, putting together these different pieces would really help us solve this bigger problem together? Yeah, well, there's lots of reasons about why depression to me and mental health was so central, because it is, seems to be the central issue. The database is a continuum. You know, everything we see, we see along a continuum. All these labels that people get are just not what we see in the database. We all have bits of stress, yeah. bits of anxiety, even bits of depression, ADHD, bits of wellness, bits of peak performance, and they're dynamical. So this continuum is what we see. But for me, depression was always, uh, because it's one of the most ubiquitous uh, mental health disorders, because it's the slippery slope part that the stress, people feel stressed and they get a little bit more frustrated and then you can trigger your anxiety, your fight flight system gets activated. And then you start getting negative and the negativity magnifies and it can start destroying all your thoughts and make you, you really shut down and become, you know, what, what, Martin Seligman called learned helplessness, where what you do doesn't seem to affect your 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 what, what's happening to you anymore, and people give up, and it's a very very dangerous situation. And if they fall over a cliff and they start having suicidal thoughts and very negative thoughts, very problematic, hugely common. I mean, it's shocking how many people, you know, like I think like thirteen percent of the population of the United States are on antidepressants of people over the age of eighteen. I mean, it's it's almost unbelievable. And now we've got all these other treatments that are coming out. You know, RTMS for electrical stimulation, ketamine injections, uh, psilocybin. I mean, Silicon Valley. Here we are. Psilocybin is tremendously interesting, and um, so is ketamine because it changes the flexibility of your brain, which means it allows you, and also do antidepressants if you get it right. So there's that. We got funded to do it, which was a big factor. Um, to done, it. But we would have done it anyway. I mean, we were doing it on big, small scale, big scale. But the bottom line is that depression is the mother load of mental health. It's in every major mental health disorder. Depression is a big component. So what is different, though, is in the study that we got funding for, a very large international study, we developed the first genetics test for predicting who is going to respond to an antidepressive and who is not. Now, again, this is just the tip of the spear, and it's just another example of standardization, integrative methodology, 55 publications from many laboratories around the world, all the data pooled, and now the genetics test that is the key, because everybody trusts genetics. And it's quite so stable. And because we know that all of these mental health disorders have a genetic component. Sometimes they're multiple genes. So, you know, for example, in, in alcoholism or in bipolar disorder, there's lots of genes, schizophrenia even more so. But there still are genetic factors that in combination are predisposing the cycle of decline, whether it's negativity. So I come from a family, for example, where there's clearly a genetic load on anxiety. And um, we did a twin study that anxiety is about 60% heritable. Everything can be changed. And with the combination of the right plan, the right personalization, the right thing at the right time, coupled with the, with the informed information about genetics. Other genetics tests can tell you two things. One is, are you going to get a side effect? from a specific medication, and if so, choose another one. For any medication, you can tell through your genetics whether or not you're likely to have side effects. That's a very serious piece of knowledge. Why you wouldn't want to know that for everything you put in your mouth is beyond me. Now, the second piece that's missing is how do I know if a specific drug is going to work on me? So now we've just found that test. It's the first test to my knowledge in psychiatry, and it's, you know, Coming from a cardiology, a cardiac background in cardiology, give someone a treatment without a test. Mm. But psychiatry has no tests that predict who is going to get better. Psychiatry has got to catch up to the rest of medicine. And I think 
this test will be a part of that catch-up process. So we've got the test and you helping us to getting the test to market and your bioinformatics team are going to be analyzing the data with us. That has never existed before. Mm -hmm. So that is a test that you and uh, map my genome and uh, total brain slon demand um, are doing and it is game changing. And if you add that test to the side effects test as well, that is game changing. And if you add that to everything else we talked about before, which is reduce the stress because it's more than just taking antidepressants or ketamine or any of these or increasing your cognitive flexibility you want to take all the pieces that work for a person for some people it's resonant breathing for other people it's mindfulness meditation music a lot of people just love music neurotunes we call it or brain music labs music for other people it's yoga for other people it's exercise one of the key people we work with is Heidi Hanna who's, who's, who's interviewed 50 stress um, experts around the United States and I'm a fellow of the American Institute of Stress thanks to her as to her introduction and and I've seen from the American Institute of Stress there and there are marvelous things that help people curiosity humor aromatherapy. I mean, the list is in very long. But the bottom line is that we need a systematic way to collaboratively bring these pieces together and not in a willy-nilly manner, not because some, you know, sort of celebrity somehow found that, you know, smelling candles is, a, is great for them. Great. I have no problems with that. But I do have problems with it when it's brought into a mental health okay. environment without a proper test of the extent to which it's not just a placebo or just a fun, cool thing to do. And secondly, and most importantly, the comparative effectiveness. So bringing everything together in a standardized method, meth methodical manner, building personalized programs that you can systematically find the best pieces that work for that person at that time and then track them across their lives to modify it as needed and empower them more and more. They become the center of the treatment, not the doctor. They are the doctors are the guards on the side, and they need to be brought into the center of this equation with chatbots and with whatever works. And lastly, I would just say that um, it's just critical to really have evidence as to what is working, the extent that it's working, and the comparative effectiveness. So what I mean by that. That, you know, a lot of things work, but sometimes they don't work very much. And if you read the, the magazines and the clickbait media and the celebrity sea of absolute nonsense out there, and um, well-intentioned as some of it might be, it doesn't really tell you the extent to which one thing is better than another and by how much. So let me end off on a concrete example. There are things that reduce your cholesterol. So if you run a big study and you take uh, any lots of the ways that you can reduce your cholesterol and you say, we have found that this new supplement oh, wow. reduces your cholesterol significantly. You look at the study, it says it's statistically significant. We did a thousand people had no supplement. And, uh, and then you look at, well, to what extent did it change it? Not did it change it? Yeah. And you look and you know how much it changes it sometimes? Like less than 2%. And you go, hang on a moment. That's not going to make any difference to me getting atherosclerosis. And that is the problem, I knew, that all of these pieces need to be brought together by hardcore professionals. And I don't think there's any excuse for the so-called alternative therapy. There's no such a thing in my mind. I am a big alternative therapist junkie. I believe in anything that works. I love biofeedback, neurofeedback. I love some supplements like omega-3. I think it's one of the best supplements I've ever seen. It's a matter of evidence. And you cannot, just because you're not in a mainstream, and pharmaceutical companies have got a lot to answer. They do a brilliant job at building in some of these medications, but medications per se is not necessarily the only answer. There could be more natural and alternative ways like ginkgo biloba which is widely used in germany and um, but it doesn't work on everyone exactly. so it's simply a matter of randomized studies on a large scale in standardized databases 
that work out the comparative effectiveness, and it's all made transparent. If you take ginkgo biloba, this is the extent it's going to improve your depression on these people. But hey, that's not good enough on this percentage of people. They need to try something else. Let's try them on an antidepressant. If you fail, let's go to RTMS, electrical. If that fails, let's try ketamine. If that fails, let's try psilocybin. Genetics seem to have the largest likelihood of the predictability of what works. And how do we know that? Cancer. Yeah. When I was a medical student, cancer was not treated or treatable. Mm -hmm. And today, when we look at the precision medicine of cancer, it is truly a miracle. And that is what we will say. And it's purely because of genetics. And that is what we're going to see in the whole of medicine and all these therapies are all beautifully valid. It doesn't matter what doorway you come in, whether you come in as a science-based person who believes that the science is your answer alone, or whether you come in as a spiritual person who believes that my belief is also that there's something greater than who we are that is part of my therapy. Marvelous. If you want to come in as somebody who says, I have discovered psilocybin, and it is the most amazing thing that changed my life. Brain stimulation. It, it doesn't matter what doorway you come in. What matters is the evidence, mm -hmm. what works, the extent to which it works, and the extent to which that solution is sustainable. And it is not a complicated formula. What's complicated is the competing commercial interests and vested interests that make it hard to see the signal from the noise. Absolutely. Just because it works for an actor or because they show that it works for that person uh, doesn't mean it works for everyone. And I think what is good about genetics is that you find that, you know, it doesn't matter which lab does it, you'll still get the same genotype. And, and exactly you'll right. Get the same, uh, and the same gene expression for that matter. Yeah. You know, don't fall for uh, somebody else's solution because that might not necessarily be the right one for you. But if there is a certain belief that, you know, like you mentioned, different kinds of therapies work for people, maybe even that has an influence on how effective it is going to be for them as well. Well, I think placebos are part of the complexity. I mean, I have hundreds of examples where placebos work. You know, if I, I remember as a young medical student, I taught children how to stop stuttering these are young kids they were six years old and i gave them something that said this will stop your stuttering and and it turned out that it did and i was so shocked by that that i stopped doing it because it was obviously a placebo yeah. and it didn't stop their stuttering in a sustainable enough manner and fortunately i did that under the umbrella of a speech and hearing therapy master's program, which they asked me to come and help and say, are there any brain related ways we can look at this? It was clearly a placebo and not a sustainable. So then they still, you know, in the examples with epilepsy, where people can have a plastic flower, if they've got allergic reactions, see the plastic flower and, and get a, and literally trigger. So there are very other powerful forces at work in the brain. And we also have to factor in for those. But we want sustainable, mm -hmm. mechanism-based. Placebos can be helpful to some degree. You know, even when somebody who's authoritative tells you something. True. People get confidence. Remember, we come back to the fun. The fundamental derailer is fear. Fear of failure. And that's why the alternative, so-called alternative medicine industry has been so successful. They're obviously people who are warm, articulate, validating and often doctors it's not that well trained in the ways of dealing with humans and motivational interviewing but that doesn't mean to say that they don't can't all be brought together by looking at the most effective components of each and there's no best way to do anything the best way is what works for that person because of the evidence absolutely the i i spot or the one that uh, the depression test basically is based on evidence and genetics, yeah. Genetics, and we have collaborated, which is putting together, you know, your the understanding of where you are today in terms of the brain based on the questionnaire and and others that you ask them on your app, and putting together the genetics. 
Um, maybe if you can explain why why we've done that, um, you know, because clearly you know, genetics is one component of of uh, overall well being or or mental wellness. What advantage does a person get by putting these pieces together? Yeah. Well, marvelous question. What a lovely way to just try to bring it all together. In the brain, we know we've got, when you see these pieces, that a lot of it is non-conscious intuition. A lot of it is rational. The more you bring it together, the more you empower it, the more you've got control over what's going on. And the way we do that is we challenge our biases because biases is the first key. The other ways, we looked at the body. We said there are two systems, stress, fight, flight. There's some good stress, but it becomes toxic, big problems and inflammation, and calm and flexible, this variable, flexible, like evolution, flexible, it adapts, 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 confident thinking, they're all interplaying all the time. Mm -hmm. And then the third part of the stool was genetics. So you've got genetics in every single cell neuron of our body, the entire genome, the whole thing, every single piece of coding that creates who we are, how we function, what are our predispositions to what side effects and what are our predispositions to what works? So why would you not add the genetics insight in the same way we're adding the brain insight, conscious, non-conscious, strengths and limitations, getting the homeostasis right in our body and brains. Why would you not bring the two sides of the coin together with now adding the genetics piece? So in our first collaboration which was in getting this test to market through the fda marvelous for depression but in the second example of our collaboration where we take all the map my genome tests on wellness mm. and we combine them collapse them into a, a very simple short integrative report that whatever you're looking at now and working on whether it's your stress whether it's your exercise, your eating, your sleep, or even your kosher social connectivity to some degree, and certainly your overall resilience, Map My Genome is providing us with the most validated genetic insights that exist. So now we've got the empowerment of, and the beauty, as I say and said to you at the beginning of the podcast, all of that genetic flexibility and smarts and simplification and pragmatism has become because of you. Now, I know you've got a marvelous team, Budbuff and everyone else, and I know even your husband is a rock star and he helped, you know, he's got all of these pieces and he's many, many people that work for you around the world, actually. But it's you that has brought this together in this pragmatic, simplified way that's not simplistic. And I think that is the hardest thing to do because I know that I had to try and do that in the brain and it was not easy and it was derailed by lots of things and by many people and by very for many forces and somehow I kept it alive and yours is flourishing and so bringing those two pieces together is remarkable and it's going to be powerful and is powerful already but it's going to be more powerful so that to me is why I hope I knew from this podcast that the takeaway is not that we're trying to minimize the complexity, but that we've put a lot of thought and a lot of work into distilling the essence to empower people to see that there is an essence and it fits together very simply. The brain, the body, the heart, the immune system, the gut biome, and the genetics. It's a marvelous, it's the ultimate applied integration and it's the ultimate self empowerment thank you and and i think uh you you put all these pieces together i was going to ask you about the gut biome and and you just mentioned that as well because uh, i think you you had in your in your whole uh, distillation of the brain thought and others that uh, part of the intuition has the gut the other things and one of the things we are finding for instance as evidence is that there is, uh, based on certain bacteria, you do find that uh, depression is likely to be higher as well, right? So what are your thoughts on these newer emerging uh, technologies like your gut microbiome? You talked a little bit already about epigenetics. Yeah. 
So it's it's very interesting because to me, I still like to start off with the basics that you've got, you know, your stress mm -hmm. and your calm, flexible. But I always think it's about homeostasis. At the end of the day, it's how do they all interplay? It's about the timing, the interplay of homeostasis. And of course, the gut biome has been a revolution in itself. Let's not forget that most of our serotonin is in the gut. And of course, it is quite unbelievable. And when you say to people, what's your intuition? They go, I, I get a gut feeling. Gut feeling so yes. there's some obvious connection. Now, when I say to people, actually, your intuition's in your brain. They go, no, 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 it's in my gut. I go, okay, it's in your gut. But the reality is your gut is a long way down in terms of timing. But it just shows how interconnected this thing is. Your intuition, you're rapidly taking your past experience and you're predicting the most likely outcome to a situation. And it gives you a sense in your brain as to, and it drives your brain straight away in one direction or another. And then that becomes consciously aware of that in your gut. Your gut has a, is a remarkably important engine for health, because let's not forget everything we take in and everything we push out is coming through there. And um, and they're just amazing microcellular processes that have been found to be critical in that gut health. Mm -hmm. uh, the gut biome is very integrally connected to the immune system. See, so the mother load of the immune system still is the vagus. And of course, the vagus is driven by the amygdala, the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis. So it's all a, a friend of mine, Nancy North, uh, is a marvelous uh, chiropractor thinker, and she often teaches me more and more about the kinetic chain you know think about our whole kinetic chain from our brains to the tip of our heads of our feet to our big toes when you think about it as a kinetic chain our body and our movement the same thing for homeostasis it's the all the mechanisms and when you think about the fight flight and the vagus and you think about it as part of the immune system with the vagus it's not in essence it's not that complicated because you can see if you throw that out of balance it's problematic and have all sorts of consequential impacts. Just like if you start off with the brain and you're negative in your thinking and, or somebody's an opportunist and you feel hard done by, you're going to be reactive. That's not helpful. And it's better to just let it go and become more positive. This is something I'm not that good at. But it's obviously more helpful to be positive. Sure, take your learnings forward. When you take toxic stress, it's clearly it's going to kill you. You might as well start learning ways to switch into fight flight. And the same with your gut biome. If you've got a gut biome that is full of SOS foods, and the key word to me that is the greatest killer other than stress, inflammation. And remember, we have genetic inflammation. We have gene expression inflammation. We have immune system markers. So inflammation to me, like you don't have to know much about biology to know that Inflammation is not a good thing. Toxic, chronic inflammation. So when you think about your gut biome like that, you know, taking a little bit of sauerkraut in the morning and eating good food and reducing your SOS and processed food, it's not the most complicated thing in the world. Half your plate, fruit and vegetables, half your plate, you know, healthy proteins and legumes, it's actually not that hard. And then lastly, although so I shouldn't tell people that because they are negatively pushed back. So which one do you think you should choose? Toxicity and death, slow death and toxicity, a plate, 50-50 plate, your choice. And then lastly, the immune system, which to me is kind of like a brain in itself. I mean, it's not a brain in itself. There's nothing close to the 85 billion highly interconnected neurons and 80 you know, trillion connections and all the hundreds of years, millions of years of evolution, actually, that are in every cell of our body. I mean, there's very little. People in AI here in Silicon Valley, they think that computers are going to have, you know, be have a greater sense of sentience or equal sentience to the brain. I, I'd like to see, I mean, AI is genius and it is remarkable, but that highest level of integrative, all the pattern recognition issues, very hard to beat that at this point. And so the immune system is super exquisitely connected and has such a remarkable army of killer cells and health generating cells and ways in which we repair 
it's miraculous. I mean, to me, these cosmoses that live within us are just a remarkable privilege to even have a, a, the most smidgen of knowledge mm -hmm. as to how amazing they are. So all of this is happily working together, I think, Anu, to synergize into peak health and thriving. The other thing that I, I would say is that people who think they can just dabble, do a little bit here and there, it's not. This is a very powerful ecosystem, mm -hmm. and you can't just dabble a little bit. You've got to take it seriously, or in order to affect it, it needs to have a strategic, planned approach. Mm -hmm. And that's not me telling people anything. That's just factual. That it is not that easy to fix without a, yeah. you know serious convergence of the pieces we've been talking about tonight. Fascinating. Amazing. So so one thought that came in my mind was, you know, when you look at a lot of different types of, you know, and we talked a little bit about alternative therapies and all, but there is the Ayurveda system of the Indian, um, you know, where they looked at the body as a whole. Uh, there is, um, you know, the Chinese systems. There are many more ancient systems. And in the beginning, they did take the patient or the customer or uh, to be the one that you're you're going to, you know, look as an individual and then see what you can fix in that, right? Today, I think what we are talking about in many ways is putting some of those pieces together with a lot more evidence and a lot more validation from different scientific bodies. Um, we had started straying off into, you know, it's especially more so in countries like India where, you know, even for a stomach ache or, or something simple, people would rush to a tertiary care hospital because you're paying for, for that yourself. But I think, you know, if people start to understand a more holistic approach, a more, you know, understanding that there is, you are different from others, right? I mean, you are similar, but you are not the same. And I think, you know, those insights, whether it is coming from, you know, genetics and what you do, how you've been conditioned, what your epigenetics is, uh, how your, what your biases are and everything else, I think makes an individual so unique. And hopefully, I think we'll get to a point where many of these pieces of knowledge will converge uh, into something that more of us might find uh, valuable. Yeah, look, I really love that thought a lot. So I know we've gone through a lot of integrations tonight, but I think the one that you've just said is the highest integration. And it's one that has intrigued me the most. And that is cultural. Mm -hmm. Because there's so, you know, the thing that I found most interesting, I know, as an applied integrative neuroscience, my privilege has been to look across the landscape of the brain, mind and soul, is that there's tremendous polarization. You know, people believe... When it comes to calmness, East is better than West. When it comes to science, West is better than East. This is all actually the biggest myth. The biggest myth is that it's all not a continuum and that it doesn't matter what door, what culture, there are wisdoms. It's about integrative wisdom. And so what you've just said is the most highest level of wisdom because just like there are 4,000 different religions, right? Look how many religions are at war. For what? Imagine if we just integrated the learnings, the wisdoms across those religions and focused on the wisdom, mm -hmm. the remarkable wisdoms. I mean, this week there's a, 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 a ketamine um, podcast where there's a friend of mine in New York who's a psychiatrist and he does ketamine to increase brain flexibility in depression, serious depression. And then he happens to be a Buddhist and he applies the Four Noble Truths and the eight pillars to his patients. I was privileged enough to speak at the same conference as, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama about happiness. He said, in truth, mm -hmm. you give me a better truth than the one I've got, I'll switch to it. And I've never, you know, to me, these are sort of spiritual guides that are just marvelous, that who are prepared to, and you know, as you know, he's stimulated a lot of research into meditation. And so to me, um, the spiritual uh, and and Herbert Benson studied meditation in India, and him and he he brought that knowledge back to Harvard, and he he literally changed the basis of our understanding of 
repetition of stimuli and relaxation. So the wisdoms, bringing them together is the key. And I loved your example of Ayurvedic medicine, brilliant wisdoms in there. Chinese medicine. As a young medical student, I knew I, my, I chose, I had an elective period and I chose acupuncture. And I said, because we have no understanding about it. And it turned out to be the most fantastic project. And then people said to me, yeah, well, we do not understand the physiology or even the anatomy of this. And so I happened to be an ex-anatomist as part of my science studies. So I took the, the meridians. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine, Alan Gordon, and I were studying biofeedback. We just hired it, engineers and we built a galvanic skin response system that changed as the, as the skin response changed. And guess what? It picked up the meridians using a simple Western metric. I looked at the meridians and I looked at my knowledge of anatomy and it turned out that the bifurcation points of the autonomic nervous system was where many of these pressure points and meridians were. As a young medical student, just one of my early examples of trying to overlap complementary insights. I would be surprised, Anu, is when the fullness of time, when people much smarter and more integrative than me come along, and they don't find marvelous complementarities between Chinese medicine and Western medicine. And all of this polarization starts dissipating and the comparative effectiveness of what works in whom and what genetic makeup starts rising. I, I totally agree. I think I also have uh, had the fortune of meeting a Buddhist monk who came to India, searched for some, I mean, also studied here, um, has written a book. I think his name is Shoki Matsumato, and he's written this, he's written a few books. Sometimes when you just search for the truth, you might find it in different places. When I was talking to him, we realized that I had that book sitting in my bookshelf. I'd read it, not knowing that I know him as a person. And then I realized that some of the insights that you get from there, whether it's from Buddhism or any other place, ultimately, like you said, if you're searching for the truth, you'll find it. It is not that one is better than the other or vice versa. If we all agree, think that we should find a better truth and we can accept that there is we are wrong or or we can be more correct if you will and i think that's what science is about as well right i mean science is also about you know finding out that we found something that is a better truth than what we thought by finding evidence i think ultimately everybody is searching for the same thing but somewhere there are still people who argue about different pieces yeah, because people want to, you know, it comes back to that neural epicentricism. Right. In science, people believe, scientists believe that what they're doing is the epicenter. In religion, each religion, 4,000 religions, think about that. Each one thinks that their religion is the special one. It's remarkable. But all religions are marvelous wisdom systems. And so, um, I mean, I'm really looking forward to come and visit you in India next year and learn more about, because I mean, the facts of the matter is that we've learned more wisdom and historically from India than any other place in terms of spiritually. They're just the magnitude, the, the timeline, but everywhere is there. There's Chinese, the Chinese systems have had 5,000 years of insights too. And it's about growth mindset, the openness to find and bring together wisdoms wherever you found them. So having lived in South Africa, I happen to be privileged again to be invited to a crawl of a witch doctor, so-called witch doctor, who was the first witch doctor who could speak English. He was a Zulu witch doctor. His name was Credo Matwa. And he wrote a marvelous book called Indaba, My Children. And I sat at his feet on the floor in the dust, in the kraal where he was throwing bones and stones. And I tell you, Anu, I learned as much from that man about humanity than I learned from anyone. And then I went to Australia and I learned, and again, this is just tip of the iceberg, went and learned about Aboriginal culture. And I mean, their knowledge of living and adapting in the desert mm. is just got to be seen to be believed. And then, of course, I have many friends in India and many people who have gurus who are from India, my wife. You know, she she has a, a, a guru she's been following and he's brilliant. I mean, he's marvelous. He's dead, but he's um, and uh, I have uh, friends like Peter Cooper and Sup Supana Basin who, who are 
members of the art of living, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. I've met him, a physicist, marvelous man. And there are lots of people who each bring their wisdom that can be distilled. As long as there's some hubris, there's lack of hubris in this, I mean, sorry. And there's humility about no one has a monopoly of wisdom, no culture. And I know this is my bias. My wife keeps reminding me this is my bias, that the brain is the only thing we have in common. And if I'm wrong, I'd love to know how I'm wrong. But if all of these cultures and all of these nationalistic, horrifying battles the only thing we have in common, and it's deeply in common, and that's why my PhD supervisor set up the Cradle of Humanity. It's a World Heritage Foundation where Mrs. Blaise was found. We all come from the same place. Exactly. At the end of the day, it is it is about bringing the wisdoms together exactly as you said, where you find them, and I believe that is inevitable. I really believe that's inevitable, that that's going to happen on scale, and I believe that AI are going to be helpful in that. I know it's got tremendous, tremendous challenges and dangers, but the helpfulness of AI, it is the perfect machine to bring together all the wisdoms, all the knowledge of history across everything we've been talking about. And then if you add the kind of Questy.ai versions, I'm not saying that's the only version, there'll be hundreds. We start have, hopefully having a battle between the usual princes of darkness who are going to exploit it and the princes of light or the princesses of light or whoever they're going to be, the lemuses of light, but to break down this them and us, to me, that is the ultimate real barrier is this polarization and this neural epicentricism becoming larger into them and us. And once that them and us starts going to what it really is, we are one race, there's only us, and the genetics tell us so, because 99 point some percent of our genetics are identical. Absolutely. If you had any superpower, what would that be? Such a hard question. If I Massive signal integration. But with neuroscience, I have to say my bias would be that neuroscience, that the brain that is, the, the better, is the best window to, to bring it all together. Uh, which book would you recommend? of yours for the average reader? The brain from knowing to doing. If you had to eat only one food for the rest of your life, what would that be? Air fried potatoes. Okay. <laughs> you'll, get the, you'll get your fats, you'll get your carbs. Which was your worst subject at school? Afrikaans. If you had to do something more of and something less of, what would that be? More humility, less reactivity to problems. I think you already do that. Um, you are one of the most work in humble, progress. The most humble person, and and the most no, 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 no. Trust me, that is one thing I'm sure of. I think I'm 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 still quite a selfish person. Lots of flaws. Long way to go. Long, never, long way to go. We never spoke about your paintings, but I think uh, I do want to tell that they are absolutely stunning and excellent. Um, and hopefully, you will get to do uh, an exhibition in India, uh, so that people can. Can view your yeah, I look forward to that. Yeah. I, I want to I want to tell you one thing about painting, Anu, and I urge people to to just draw paint. If you want to do it in in AI, just go to Mid Journey where you can talk into Mid Journey and it'll do a painting for you. It's it's actually quite remarkable. The paintings were my non-conscious brain teaching me about myself, and that was the most amazing lesson of all mm. that the non-conscious brain rules. And we can try to persuade ourselves that it doesn't. But painting is a wonderful way to see what your preferences are in color, in pattern, detail or pattern, the balance. So I found painting more than just painting. Uh, and in fact, there's one of the other podcasts I did with a, a, the same friend, a friend of mine who does the ketamine and Buddhism is on um, Andy Warhol's brain. And if people get a chance to watch that podcast, it's on dreviangordon.com. Art, I knew has been an integral part of human evolution because I think it's a reflection of the non-conscious part of our brain, whereas we are so biased towards rational part of our brain. And so art has been a very integral part of this journey. And thank you for me mentioning it in this 50th milestone podcast and this 
marvelous journey you've taken me on on all your very very good questions throughout uh, my my little attempt at uh, applied integrative neuroscience thank you thank you i think you have so much knowledge and so many insights to share with everyone and uh, i think you don't I, I think your work is not i think should be talked about a lot more it has been the basis of so many things that we see today becoming commercial becoming more part of your, our daily activities. So thank you for all the research you've done over the years, all the integration that you've done. And hopefully you'll, you'll, be, you'll succeed in doing what we talked about in the end, which was all the other uh, pieces of medicine and other things that we can put together. Thanks to you, Anya, and you've just been such an example. And thanks to the hundreds, hundreds of scientists who've worked with us in good spirit. Um, good luck to the opportunists. But thank you so much to the many, many people and all the great, great um, influencers like Stephen Koslow, Walter Freeman, all these huge people who shared so magnanimously as they changed each aspect of this, this field of applied integrative neuroscience. I really think Map My Genome is a special company that does special things. And I really do believe that that is primarily due to you. And so thank you for the wonderful journey and collaboration that we've had together. Thanks everyone for uh, being with us on this 50th podcast. I think this was a very special podcast and thank you again. Thank you.